This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hi, welcome or welcome back to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist from Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I began this podcast now almost five years ago in order to extend my practice to those of you who might already be very interested in psychology, perhaps you're even in therapy, but would be curious enough to hear from another therapist. To those of you who might just have been diagnosed with something and you're really looking for answers, or perhaps you're having a relationship problem that's just can't quite understand it or get it changed. And then also to a third group, to those of you who might say to your friends, I'd never darken the door of a therapist, but you're just curious enough or, sadly, unhappy enough to listen to self-work. When I first began trying to sort out what I meant by the label perfectly hidden depression, and those of you who have been listening for a while know that I wrote a book by that name, one of the most enraged responses to a certain post came from someone whose words held intense anger and what you term perhaps defensiveness or protectiveness. She said, you're describing an INFJ from the Myers-Briggs and pathologizing it. I can't believe someone who's a therapist would do that. And then she said some pretty scathing things about my intelligence, something about how could I be so stupid not to know the subtleties of the Myers-Briggs designations. First, I tried to explain to her that the term PhD, or perfectly hidden depression, was simply a way I was trying to help people see that perfectionism and an intense need for control might have developed as the best way to emotionally adapt to a very painful family or cultural situation, the hidden pain growing more potent as well as the inherent loneliness as the years went by. As I remember, that response went nowhere. My words had obviously hit her hard. Maybe that meant there was something she didn't want to see. Maybe it meant that I needed to look into the INFJ more and educate myself. Because I don't know the subtleties of the Myers-Briggs system. But what now it makes me realize is how the search to get yourself, the need to know who you are, is fierce. And when you find a way to do so, it can become the way you organize your life. It's self-understanding, thinking you have an idea of who you are, how you appear to others, what your impact is on those around you, and even why you are important. And perhaps that's why the Enneagram and Myers-Briggs test are so popular, because they help you figure yourself out as well as give you a clue to other people. And they can be very effective. We're switching gears a little. So when I listened in on the first two episodes of The Me You Can't See, a new documentary on mental illness produced by Oprah Winfrey and Prince Harry, I thought about this search for ourselves. Harry pointed out that with so many who've carried silent emotional pain for years, the question isn't, what's wrong with you? The question is, what's happened to you? So today on Self Work, sponsored by our newer sponsor, Athletic Greens, we're also going to talk about the frightening fact that perhaps you cannot see me, as the title of their extraordinary program reflects, but also about the fact that so many of us struggle to see what we keep hidden from others. Perhaps we don't even see it ourselves. That's what Harry said. He wasn't even aware there were things he couldn't see, and that's true of all of us to some extent. Because this is also true. You cannot see me, but perhaps neither can I. The listener email today is a very painful one from a young woman who was sexually abused in her past. The perpetrator was a family member, in fact her father, but who also found out that that same father sexually abused her daughter. Her mother doesn't know, and she doesn't know whether to tell her or not. What would you say? So sit back and relax, or do the task you're working on while you listen to self work. However you listen, I'm so glad you're here. In fact, I'm honored you're here. And let's talk about the me you can't see, but maybe even the me I can't see. The Me You Can't See is a new documentary on mental illness produced by Oprah Winfrey and Prince Harry, and it is extraordinary. 
Why? Because it's focusing not on the question, what's wrong with you, but on the question, what happened to you? When I heard Harry say these very words, a tear came to my eye. It was a tear of relief that the damage that trauma wreaks, that hides under years and layers of adapting and coping and fighting through, might finally be understood for what it is. It was a tear of hope that this message could be heard by those who so desperately need to hear it, voiced by people we might assume have come through tragedy or hardship without a scrape. And it was a tear of respect for those very people on this broadcast, including Lady Gaga or Stephanie, as she used her real name, that I watched as they ripped open their veils of having it all together so that their vulnerability, their struggle, could help others understand and begin to accept their own. But as I listened, I remembered the eyes of others that had come to me in therapy not knowing what in the world was wrong, but knowing that their thoughts of hurting themselves were becoming stronger and stronger, although perhaps they wouldn't tell me that. Their fear and confusion mounting to the point that they risked the very thing that was anathema to them, admitting, I need help. Their confusion was palpable, yet their denial and discounting was just as robust. For not only can you hide your pain from others, hiding emotional pain from yourself can feel as normal as putting away groceries or emptying the trash. You just don't see it anymore. Rigid compartmentalization becomes a protective habit. It's how you cope and adapt. It's what your circumstances mandate. It's what you're taught is necessary or brave, and it becomes the armor you wear so that today's battles can be withstood. But... That pain only grows more potent the longer it lies unexpressed or unorganized. And as I said in the intro, maybe you can't see me, but we can all struggle to see ourselves, honestly, armor off. Perhaps that's why assessments of personality are as popular as they are. We have a hunger for self-understanding. What are the traits that make me, me? And we're all looking for answers. In fact, Harry said it wasn't until his wife came into the picture that he realized that he was riddled with issues because of the losses in his life, of course, including the tragic death of his mother. Now, whatever you think of him, I've read where many are saying that he's spoiled or self-pitying. That's up to you. But I can't quite imagine being someone like him. Celebrity isn't all it's cracked up to be. But let me also be quick to say I've worked with former prison guards, lawyers, people who man the chicken lines, paramedics, to about any profession and any social or economic range of folks you can imagine. All ethnicities, many religions, many sexual orientations, all can be surprised by the realization that something they knew had happened to them might be influencing them in a destructive way now. The Myers-Briggs or the Enneagram tells you what you are, perhaps, and to so many people that's incredibly helpful information. That categorization and seeing what your strengths are, as well as what you perhaps struggle with, is a way of finding self-acceptance and self-understanding. And those assessments have their place, there's no doubt about it. Hence, the woman's outrage with me for finding a problem with what she considered INFJs was actually very personal to her. Little did she know that if my memory serves, I also scored as being an INFJ when I took the Myers-Briggs in graduate school. So, there you have it. But there's an even more important question. Why? What happened in your life that led you to who you are today? Not just who you are, but why you're who you are. And that question is important. Before we get to that, let's hear from SelfWork's newest sponsor, Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens came on board SelfWork now a few months ago with an offer for SelfWork listeners to try their product. And because of being a SelfWork listener, you'd receive bonus products as a gift with a subscription. I don't really know how many of you have tried it, but quite a few I can tell. And I'd love to hear from you about how you're feeling please email me at AskDrMargaret at DrMargaretRutherford.com because I'd love to share your experience here on SelfWork. So some of you are saying, what is Athletic Greens? It's a life-changing nutritional habit. Their daily all-in-one superfood power is your nutritional essential. It's by far 
the easiest and most delicious nutritional habit that you can add to your daily routine today and empower yourself toward better habits. And it's a lot more pleasant than eating celery, I promise you. I've never liked powdered things, but this one isn't too sweet, but also not too grainy. And I look forward to it in the morning. You're actually just getting optimal nutrition on a daily basis. And you don't have to take multiple supplements. Just one thing. I take a scoop a day and know that I'm getting 75 vitamins, minerals, whole food source ingredients, including a multivitamin, multimineral, probiotic, green superfood, and more. In fact, I just had my annual OBGYN appointment, and his last words to me were, make sure you're getting enough D3, and the supplement you receive as the self-work bonus with the subscription contains both D3 and K2. So I smiled and said, oh, I got that. I hope you'll try it. Both my husband and I love it and have kept it up now for several months because it's making a difference. So here's the link, athleticgreens.com slash selfwork. That's, of course, HTTPS colon slash slash athleticgreens.com slash selfwork. And I'll have that link for you in the show notes. So let's pick up where we left off. If you look at the diagnostic manual used by all mental health professionals, the only place it describes trauma is when PTSD is mentioned. Yes, certainly that's caused by trauma. But most of us would think when we hear that, well, trauma means that you've been in a war or you saw your best friend die in a car accident. Trauma are things that are undeniably difficult experiences and outside the realm of normal experience. So it's easy to say, well, I've never been in a war. I've never had anything like that happen to me, so I must not have trauma. You might not say that having a stepfather who scorned and punished you if he could find a speck of dust on the furniture was trauma. Or a mother having a public scale in your home where she posted your weight for all to see when you're overweight was a big deal. Or a mom who had untreated OCD and became unhinged if you messed up your clothes out of their pristine organization and you were a six-year-old. Or a grandfather who took you out fishing, but on the way home, you had to drive home because he was so wasted at eight years old. You got through it, you managed, you coped, you don't have a mental illness that you're particularly aware of, you went on and lived life. That's what you're supposed to do, right? That's good old stoicism, that's not feeling sorry for yourself, or at least that's what you can say, or your family can say, or your culture could say. You could even be highly protective of these very people. She did the best she could. My dad was abused, so he didn't know how to be a dad. I get it. I walked out of a therapist's office one afternoon who suggested my mom had significant problems. To their credit, the DSM is going to include what's called complex trauma, which is the closest thing to developmental trauma, which I believe in, that they've had ever. And even now, it's included in something called the ICD-11, which is the diagnostic code medical doctors use. But trauma isn't always recognized. And even people who know that they were traumatized by hunger, by fear, by abuse, by neglect, by cruelty, by oppression, by rules that were impossible to keep, by rules that were constantly changing, by rules that were invisible but quite understood, will often leave that part of their life in silence put it away in some locked closet somewhere, and convince themselves what's done is done. You survived. Now just get on with it. It's quite hard to believe, isn't it, that even Prince Harry himself didn't realize his mother's death, the way she lived, the way she died, affected him. And I'm not quoting him exactly, but he said something like, The public mourned more for my mom than I was allowed to. It was odd watching them. She was my mother. Yet acknowledgement is so important. Your past is important. You don't have to blame. It's important to acknowledge and understand and see and honor the why. That's what therapy can offer. Because given enough stress, enough pressure, enough time, that pain will begin to seep out. And finding a connection, someone will hold a safe space for you to slowly venture into that hurt or fear or anger becomes vital. That's what therapy can be. It can help you break your silence, challenge the edict of non-disclosure, and confront whatever prejudice or ignorance you might encounter can become your path into true self-compassion and self-acceptance. Let me make something clear. 
I don't have any connection with Oprah or Prince Harry or the show. But their message is one I know in my gut and my heart and my mind is vital for you and me to hear. Not all mental illness is caused by trauma, but so much of it is. Not only from your own past, but from the generations who suffered before you. It's so important to let it out, let it breathe, manage its triggers, know when it's influencing your thoughts and actions. And that holds true freedom, perhaps a freedom you may never have felt in your entire life. Someone left a review on Apple Podcasts the other day. The words he used were particularly meaningful to me. He called what I offer a steady drumbeat of a message. And I guess that's what this message is today. My steady drumbeat that acknowledging pain that has been silent is so important for self-acceptance and true freedom. Our listener email today is one that was riveting. The pain in this woman's voice was so difficult to hear. Here's a tiny bit of her story. If I was sexually abused when I was small, like two years old, I'm 47 now. How do I tell my mother we don't have a good communication? My father passed away already. And my daughter told me that my father molested her when she was nine. So it's kind of hard for me to deal with everything right now. I'm sure you could hear that same pain. Her abuse happened when she was two, and perhaps afterwards as well, by her father, who's now deceased. She stayed silent about it for many years, as she now says she's 47. But whatever scab had formed over her own woundedness was ripped off when she learned that her daughter had also been abused by the very same man, her daughter's grandfather. You can hear this woman realizing so many things. It's one thing for abuse to happen to you, but for it to happen to your child, that can feel horrific. My first thought was that as her father is dead, she may be looking for somewhere to focus her anger, finally, her rage. And it's occurring to her to tell her mother, with whom she doesn't have a good relationship, for many reasons, I would imagine. I completely understand the urge to get her anger out, just like that. It has nowhere to go, and it's very difficult to manage, and this would give her a channel. We'll talk about in a second what that might lead to and the questions you need to ask. What do I mean when I say the scab was ripped off? However she'd managed to move forward to get on with her life despite her own abuse may have likely been to rigidly compartmentalize or stuff away her pain just as we've been talking about today. Maybe she told a really good friend. Maybe she got far away from her family and she coped. But now her daughter's revelation has become a trigger for her own feelings to surface. That's that scab ripping off. And that, coupled with her maternal rage and helplessness, somehow needs to be expressed. So, if she were sitting in front of me, these are the questions I'd ask. What do you hope to gain from telling your mother? What's your agenda? What are you hoping will happen? Do you have any preconceptions about how your mother will respond? Are you counting on some kind of apology from your mom? How would you handle it if she says she believes you and your daughter are lying? How will you handle your other family members knowing if your mother tells them and they pick sides? Do you think you're telling your mom as a substitute for being able to confront your dad? Do you think your mom knew? Does she have the capacity to admit that if she indeed did? Would you even believe her answer? All of these questions may seem as if I have an agenda for her not to reveal this to her mom, but that's not so. What I've learned about this kind of confrontation is that all things that might happen with a confrontation need to be prepared for, because so often a victim will have the idea that they will hear an apology or, I'm so sorry. And sadly, often that doesn't happen. The main thing is, I don't want anyone to re-victimize themselves in the process of confrontation or revelation. If they can look at themselves and say, I need to hear the words come out of my mouth, my father abused me, and he abused your granddaughter, my daughter, because somehow that will help them heal, then it may be helpful. 
But if there's more than one reason or if they cannot handle the disappointment or even chaos that might occur, then it's better to hear yourself say that in therapy or with friends in the safe space that therapy can hold and some friendships can hold. I want to stress something again. The most important thing is to not re-victimize yourself, and then that decision can be made very honestly, but very carefully. Thank you so much for being here at Self Work today. I really can't believe we're on episode number 236. It's astounding to me. And I'm very honored you're here. There are lots of ways of getting in touch with me. My website's drmargaretrutherford.com. And if you just subscribe there, one, you'll get a little free ebook that's on the seven commandments of good therapy. That's kind of a fun little gift. But also you'll get a weekly newsletter that will appear in your email that will have the weekly blog post as well as the weekly podcast and kind of let you know what's going on with me. That's about it. Short and sweet. So if you'd like that, that's a really easy way of keeping in touch with me. So many of you are leaving me messages on SpeakPipe that's available here in the show notes as well as on the website. And I love that. I love to hear your voices, your intonation. It helps me answer your question probably better. But to those of you who want to email me, that's askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. I can't respond to them all, but I do read them all. I've been talking about Perfectly Hidden Depression today. That's the book that is now on sale, has been for about a year and a half now. It's a bestseller in Poland, which is interesting because I've learned that the Polish people actually, probably because of the transgenerational trauma that they have experienced, actually have great problem with the culture mandating sort of a perfectionistic way of living. But I'm delighted and honored to have been asked to do some further work with the publicity house there in Poland. Did a video this week, etc. It's also doing very well in Korea, I might add. And it's doing well here in the United States. It came out two months before a pandemic, so what can you say? But it's perfectly hidden depression. It's not just about perfectionism. It offers 60 workbook exercises about how to do the very work we were talking about today to discover what's in your past that you might be silently struggling with. It would be so helpful if you could bring it forward. So you can get that on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or anywhere you buy books. might have to order it, but anywhere you buy books. It's also available in ebook and audiobook. I also want to remind you that I recorded about a two hour course on depression, and it's divided into 10 segments. If you go to Himalaya.com slash depression, it'll take you right to my page, and you'll get a two week free trial. That means you can listen to the course for free, and you can listen to any of the courses there at Himalaya.com for free for two weeks. It's really a great offer, so I hope you'll take advantage of it. That, again, is Himalaya.com slash depression. Please take good care, everyone. Join me at my Facebook closed group if you'd like. That's Facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. I'd love to get to know you a little more. Take very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self-Work.